I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. With the always-on interwebs, I believe that ADHD is now a communicable disease. And guess what? We're all the viruses. So how do you get your brand story to rise above the noise and be heard? Well, we'll look at one way to do that today. Hi, I'm Park Howell, and welcome to The Business of Story, where we connect you with story artists from around the world to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. On today's show, we're going to explore the concepts of irony and juxtaposition in your business stories to help them stand out, to help you stand out, especially with your visual storytelling. Our guest, James Popsis, has a unique view of life captured in the inventive and witty images he creates in Photoshop. His visual storytelling conjures up irony and juxtaposition to stop you in your tracks and trigger stories in your own mind, like his verdant, babbling brook flowing through the graffitied canals of London, or giant hot dogs grilling on the side of a building, or the schooner sailing on top of a hurricane. James and I explore where the inspiration for his images come from and how you can tap into the same muse for your stories. He'll show you how you can jumpstart your Instagram page, as you might imagine, a pretty important channel for his work. And you'll learn his three rules for finding, capturing, and telling visual stories that truly stand out. So let's open your aperture to visual storytelling right now with Photoshop artist James Popsis. Hey James, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Now, you're coming to us from sunny Wales, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, you'd you'd probably have to put sunny or an, an asterisk after sunny. It's um the sun's kind of just dipping below the clouds now. It's it's almost the time of year really when you you get a couple of days of hope where it might get above kind of three or four degrees Celsius, uh, and then it just goes away for another week or two. So we'll get there eventually. But it's um yeah winter still has its grip on the UK at the moment. Well, having grown up in sunny asterisk Seattle this time of year, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> it actually is worse in April and May because you get hints of spring and summer only to be just washed over again with, you know, 35 degrees and rain. So yeah. I, I feel your pain in Wales. Absolutely. It sounds like uh, exactly the same thing. <laughs> well, James, thanks for being on the show. I reached out to you, I think, just last week. I was literally sitting in my sunroom, sorry about that, in Phoenix, Arizona, on a <laughs> sunny Sunday morning, uh, just to underscore the sun part of this story. <laughs> and I, I think what, what I was on board Panda, and some of your stuff popped up, and I was just cracking up. I was looking through your imagery um, slide after slide and then jumped over to your website, and I said, oh, I would love to get James on Business of Story because of your approach to visual storytelling. So can you give us a little bit of backstory? How do, how do you find yourself uh, doing what you're doing these days? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I, I guess you could probably say I've always been the, the creative type. Um, I'm not particularly practical, so it kind of throws, you know, engineering and, and that kind of uh, creative thinking out the window. But I've always been looking for some kind of um, creative outlet to to get rid of some of my um, some of my idea energy, I guess you'd call it. Um, and I've I've up until about five or six years ago, I've I've never really settled on on any particular thing. You know, I've delved into um, starting blogs and undertaking design projects. Um, I've tried to write books in the past, but I've never really quite um, found anything that's fulfilled my need to create. Um, and then I started traveling a little bit more. And naturally, when you travel, you you buy a camera to 
to take photos and document your travels. Um, and even at that point, I wasn't really convinced that photography was uh, all that good an outlet for um, creativity. It always seemed like a, an avenue for documentation more than an avenue for creativity. Um, but I got back from my travels. Um, I'd kind of got more into photography while while doing a bit of a around the world trip. Um, moved to London to really kickstart a career in marketing. But in my weekends, um, I would hunt around the city looking for original photos and original compositions to, to take. Um, invariably, in a city of you know 10 million plus people, it's quite tricky to find original stuff. Um, so, you know, on the odd occasion that I would find something that I hadn't seen before, I'd set my tripod up, um, I'd sort my exposure out, sort my composition out, only to look up and find four of the people had set up right next to me to do exactly the same thing. So <laughs> yep. Eventually, I, I kind of became a bit disheartened with um, photography as I had with all the other mediums that I tried. Um, and it wasn't until I kind of accidentally happened upon a, a really... Um, basic tutorial on Photoshop. I think it was on YouTube um, that that showed kind of the what Photoshop was capable of um, and how little you really needed to know about the program in order to get kickstarted. Um, for anyone that doesn't really know all that much about Photoshop, it's it works on the premise of layers. So if you stack a couple of photos on top of each other and paint um, parts of a, the the top photo away it will reveal what's underneath. And, and that's how compositing happens. That's how photographers replace skies, um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, so, so for instance, I'm on your site right now at jamespopsis.com. And by the way, if you're listening to this and uh, you've got a chance to jump on the web, Go jump on while we're talking to James, because I think it'd be fun to combine his imagery with the audio you're hearing here. But I'm looking at a shot here of Big Ben, and you've got headphones on it, and then that eye mask that you put on at night to block out all of the darkness, which is quite a funny shot. But what is the thought of that? I mean, what is the story you're trying to communicate in that particular image? It's, um, yeah, that's an interesting one. It's, it's one I get asked about a lot, and it's, it's always one that, you know, when I'm I'm asked about it and I, I give an answer, um, I can just see kind of a drop in people's faces just because they're expecting um, a reason or a, a, a real clever um, mythology behind it. And in truth, there isn't, you know, I, typically with, with all my shots, I kind of, in that case, was walking around London uh, looking for ideas. Obviously, when you do that, you come across um, fairly iconic landmarks and settings. And then it's a case of really trying to, rather than think about what would work in this scenario in a conventional photography way, you think about what wouldn't work and what would look odd. And um, in this case, you know, if you if you're looking at juxtapositions and irony, um, I, I guess I've just tried to personify um, a, a massive clock. So it's uh, yeah, there's that one particularly. There's no real. Um, rhyme or rhythm to it it just happened to be what popped up in my head you know but it's that. funny so you have this massive clock when you said that it didn't occur to me is this like suggesting that you are muffling that alarm clock next to you because you don't want to get up and here you know big ben is probably the most iconic version of of a clock out there i guess maybe it's a way of kind of controlling time or am i just reading way too much into this story? Well, well possibly i mean the ultimate irony with that one is that i had aimed to uh get to Big Ben for sunrise, but I'd missed it woefully by about two hours. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, yeah, maybe, maybe there's unintentional meaning. It was, it was all meant to be. All right. I've got another one right next to this I'm looking at, and you've got two black cabs, you know, here in America, you just your, what you would imagine as a black taxi in downtown London. And they yeah. have a, enormous uh, suitcases on top. You've got a red one and you got a silver one. Now, what's that about? Well, that yeah, that's um, I again, I forget when it first came to me, but I think it was out of born out of frustration with um, budget airlines and being told that I'd have to check all my baggage constantly. I mean, I'm not um, the the most savvy traveler in the world, but it was really getting on my nerves and. It got to the point where I thought, right, it's it, this is getting silly. Um, how can I convey this? Um, and I guess it, it's it's another scenario where I've tried to convey something fairly iconic about London. 
um, and stick a little twist on it. I guess, again, it was a lot of this stuff is born out of um, what I thought I was capable of achieving at that particular time. And um, going back, I think I made that in maybe 2014. So it's pretty early in in my uh, explorations into what Photoshop was capable of and what I knew how to do. And, and that was just an idea that came up and uh, I thought it'd be pretty simple to put together. So yeah, that... That one has a slightly more meaning behind it, I guess. But again, it's uh, it's trying to figure out the the mist that's in my head uh, more than <laughs> more than having any uh, any real theory behind it. So, are you doing this uh, for as much for yourself? I know you do sell the prints and whatever. Or are you doing this in the advertising marketing world to uh, you know help brands stand out in a very interesting visual storytelling way? Yeah, so I'm I'm in the very early stages of doing that. Basically, I've as I touched on before, I've traditionally come from a, a marketing background. So I've worked in all kind of realms of digital marketing, whether that's content or search or paid or ads or design. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, as as I mentioned, also it's, it's kind of always been the case that for the last five or six years, this photography stuff is is what I've done at the weekends. Um, that has changed somewhat a little right now because um i've just moved back to the uk from australia and through 2017 i'm kind of going to give this a bit more of a go in terms of a as a as a career Mm -hmm. so yeah absolutely advertising will be playing a part in that and i've i've worked on some commissions as you say i I sell some prints and and things of that nature um Uh, but yeah to date primarily it's been uh it's been a hobby yeah, and I mentioned James' website earlier. I probably should spell his last name Popsis, P O P S Y S. So James dot com. If you want to go and take a look, as we're talking with James, so on this site you have a lot of different this irony and juxtapositions. Where do your ideas come from, and how do you think they reflect who you are as a story artist? Interesting. I I, I mean, I typically I I try to point to. Um, the the times that I I get my ideas um, when I'm asked that question and and invariably what I tell people is that I I don't have any ideas when I'm sat at home all my ideas come to me when I'm either on trains or on a plane or walking around a city or in the countryside uh, and I think that's mostly because um, I rely obviously fairly heavily on on what's around me for inspiration um, and the more things you see on any given day the more chance you've got of um, coming coming across something that's that's either inspiring or gives you the, the direct idea for a concept um, as I mentioned before as well I guess you know once I've um, found a scene that I think would be good for for a given concept um then it's a case of thinking well you know what would work what would be ironic about this scene does it does it involve changing uh the the size of something does it involve adding something to the scene do i need to subtract something from the scene um so it's it's kind of a it's never a quick process you know i've never um throughout kind of creating any of these concepts have i had a light bulb moment um, mm-hmm. It's usually a case of having a, an initial idea um, and letting it sit and develop for you know weeks or sometimes months while I either work out how to do it or work out how I can make it better or a, a stronger, cleaner concept. <laughs> then I'm going to plant a seed in your mind that now it'll germinate back there in your reptilian brain and one day you'll have an aha moment. I would love to see one of your images uh, reflecting story and business because I can't tell you how many business leaders I look that look at me kind of cross-eyed and like, no, that's story stuff. That doesn't really work in business. Let me tell you about my features and, and, and functions and data and let me show you a PowerPoint. Um, the irony of just how powerful business storytelling is and to get that across to people would be a fun image, at least for me anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting, certainly the perspective that I have coming from a, a marketing background and I've, I've sat on both sides of the table, both in agencies and as a client. Um, and, you know, going back a few years, a lot of the conversations we had about campaign, um, and it's interesting to see how that's changed just because everybody is is much more aware than they used to be um, that there's a whole heap of luck involved and so many variables um, within you know a, a, an idea or a campaign going viral uh, going viral that you're just not in control of it. So um, it's certainly been interesting to see 
you know how the how the thinking has changed on um, storytelling in the business sector. I mean, I've, I've got no doubt that you will ha- have uh, you know much more uh, opinion on it than than I do. Um, <laughs> But it, yeah, that's certainly been interesting. I mean, the, I think a, a lot of the the stuff holds true um, from what we we were talking about a few years ago in in the sense of aiming to go viral. But, you know, you you, you kind of need um, you need originality and you need to be able to tell a phenomenal story. Uh, but it's interesting, certainly, to see that uh, this concept of going viral is is dying down as a as a primary aim for a lot of the campaigns that are coming out now. Yeah. You know, we have in town this week the Green Biz Conference, which is a large sustainability conference. And I'm talking all the top sustainability thinkers from the major brands are here. And I do work with Arizona State University. I teach in their School of Sustainability on the side. And I um, actually did two workshops out there, one Monday afternoon on the um, circular economy. And I had the pleasure of working with the head of sustainability of Dow Packaging, Dow Chemical, head of sustainability for Procter & Gamble. Gamble and uh, the head of sustainability for UPS. And then yesterday we did another program, an hour long program, or actually half day program. Anyway, where I'm going with this is in the next room uh, to me yesterday was a great author by the name of Jonah Sachs. And he was he was on one of our very first guests a year and a half ago on Business of Story. And Jonah wrote a terrific book called Winning the Story Wars. And a point that he makes within his book, and, and the book is really pointed at people with social causes, environmental work, and that sort of thing. And how do you stand out in you know, this gluttony of communication that we're all up against? And he talks about freaks that you have to take a character or a look or something and and turn it by 5 or 10% and make it a little bit freakish in order to capture the attention of your audiences out there. It's one way to really kind of hook into it. So that reminds me of your uh, photo I'm looking at right now called Illegal Streaming. And you've taken what looks like an absolutely beautiful, green, idyllic, uh, babbling brook somewhere out there in the Wilshire countryside somewhere, um, and you've put it downtown, I guess, London, in what looks like a storm drain, all littered with, you know, the side walls are, are all graffitied out, and it's going into a tunnel there. And it's just, number one, beautifully put together, because it looks like the stream is sitting right there. But number two, it speaks to me about that irony and juxtaposition that you are about to get you to stand out in the minds, to, to get people to stop for a, just a second, like I did on board Panda because I saw this juxtaposition. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that in your work? Absolutely. I mean, I I think, um, you know, if I talk about my own experience, obviously, um, you know, being a a photographer or an artist or whatever you want to call it, uh, invariably now I spend a a fair amount of time on um, social media. So, you know, I'm on Instagram and Flickr, various places. and when you, you spend a lot of time on those platforms, you see a lot of images. And as cameras get better, as people become more knowledgeable um, and more well-tutored in um, their post-processing and things, you see more technically perfect images, um, which is fantastic on the one hand. But on the other, it dilutes the whole experience. And it means that actually, you know, as as incredible as an image, you, you know, if you, you may well see... Um, phenomenal images that actually don't give you any sense of um, emotion or uh, they don't stop you in your tracks because it's it's the same as something that you saw, saw you know, three, four seconds ago. Um, so what that has meant, I think, is that you need to have different as well as better. Um, you know, you need to be um, coming at storytelling with something completely original and that's very very difficult to do i think because everybody has a platform now um and the there has never been more noise um to to have to break through uh to get your voice heard i guess the the um the issue with that is that while you have to maintain this really super high quality, um, there has also been a, a push in in the other direction in some senses in that um, some of the stuff with, uh, let's say, slacker production values um, has really caught on over the years. So if you look at YouTube and, and vloggers, for example, um, they are taking views away from te- television at 
an incredible rate, um, and yet they are doing it with very low production values. Um, and it, it's it's very much the same in in photography. You know, it's it's no longer about um, having the sharpest lenses and getting the the exposure spot on. It's about storytelling um, because everybody is seeing technically perfect images and they see them every day. So. Um, you know, if you can find something that's different as opposed to better, um, I think you stand a, a better chance of um, of standing out. I, there's a, I'm sure many of your listeners are, are aware of a, a guy called Casey Neistat, a, um, a YouTuber who's kind of shot to fame over the last year and a half or so. And I've been following him for a few years. Um, and he gave a talk once that I found really, really interesting. And it was titled, Perfection Erases Humanity. Um, and that's kind of stuck with me, that title, because I think it, it really holds true. Um, if you look at a lot of kind of advertising and, and any real um, storytelling platform now, um, the, the places where, you know, you have um, perfect edits, uh, perfect visuals, perfect sound recording, typically aren't the places that are getting the most attention anymore. It's, um, and, and a lot of the time, I think, that is down to the fact that they are perfect and the humanity has been erased. They don't speak to people in the same way that um, a telephone conversation would or a, a vlog or a, um, a quick tweet or you know any other medium that hasn't been uh, thought through and planned for weeks on end. Um, and I find and that interesting. James, do you think that that lack of production value speaks more to the authenticity of the author themselves? So people look at that and they're like, well, I know that's just not a brand that's paid uh, some Photoshop artist big bucks to make that work. I know this is a guy or gal that's working out of her, her kitchen, you know, out of her kitchen table and is just expressing their own innate storyteller. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I really do. I mean, another, um, another Casey Neissat, theory or, or quote, I guess, is that he he seems to suggest that um, everybody's BS meter for advertising is as good as it's ever been. You know, you know, the, the second any kind of ad comes on, you know, it's an ad. Um, and you know that primarily because of the production values. Um, now, if you've got you know, a vlogger who's set up on a, a one camera system with a, a mic that's maybe not the best in the industry um, and it's not edited, you know, super well, uh, then it's it's something different. And uh, I think people are, are drawn to that um, because, you know, everybody is so good now at detecting what is an advert and what is kind of um, forced sales versus what is someone kind of being real, I guess. I like that idea that everybody's advertising BS has gotten as good as it's going to get. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting concept. They've produced the heck out of it to the point now that uh, folks like you and I and you know, we're out there doing what we can do. Uh, it's, it's about the story. It's about the content. And I will say, though, in your work, your Photoshop work is really quite exceptional. So most people, I don't know, can pull it off with what you've done. Do you ever get to the point that you fear that some of your work might look too polished? Oh, yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And mm -hmm. in fact, I've kind of, um, you know, I've gone full circle with it really. When I was um, starting out, it was like with any, any person who has bought a, a reasonably expensive camera and who has kind of gone onto an editing program knows it's very tempting to just up the colors a bit and then up them a bit more and then up them a bit more and then up the sharpness and then up that a bit more. And when you first look at it, it looks great. And then you revisit it three weeks later and you wonder what the hell you've done. Um, and it's the same with uh, compositing. You know, you can take things way too far. Um, and the conclusion I've come to is that how I, I want my, my images to be viewed is, you know, I want it to look like somebody has stepped up to a really odd scene and just snapped with their camera and that's it you know I, I don't want it to look like um i've played around with this guy too much or i've you know messed around with the colors i, I want it to look like somebody has gone up to a, a really strange scene <laughs> taking a photo with their phone or whatever they've got on them and and that's that it's like the ship in Sydney Harbor where you've got the big yellow parking notice enclosed. So apparently it got a parking ticket for being uh, harbored there. <laughs> that was uh, that 
image was actually a fairly big deal for me, not because it's um, not because it it has any particular significance to anybody else, but it, that came at a time when I was in a bit of a, a lull, I guess, um, creatively. I hadn't done much for a few weeks, um, and I got that idea, and I I kind of managed to put it together. Um, and I guess in any field of work, you know, everybody gets into a, a rough spot where they're, you know, not particularly inspired or they need another gear to go to, to, to carry on. And, and that was one of those moments for me. Yeah. Well, great. I want to discuss a few more of these and, and get a little bit more into your technique. When we come back, I'd like to give an opportunity for our wonderful sponsors to share their stories. And uh, when we come back, let's dive into a couple more of your other shots here and how you go about it and maybe give some visual storytelling tips to our listeners. Sound good? Sure. Sounds great. All right. James, will be back right after this. What do you think is one of the best ways to tell a story about your brand? How about if you let those who live it every day be your storytellers? That's exactly what Sweden did recently with a tourism campaign called Visit Sweden. The campaign let Americans dial a number that connected to an actual random citizen of that country. Reporters, of course, had a field day dialing the number and then using Google Street View to see where those various Swedes lived. You know, I first heard about this campaign in Ted Wasserman's post, The 10 Best Brand Moments of 2016 on CMO.com. You can find the link on our show notes on businessofstory.com. As Wasserman points out, in a year of major backlash to globalism, here was an effective counter argument. You see, the story marketing point here is the only way to combat an anti-story, in this case, globalization, is to tell a better story. And the best people to do that is your customers. So for this wonderful campaign, Visit Sweden is my story marketer of the week. And check out their video about the campaign on businessofstory.com in my show notes. Well played, Sweden. I can't thank you enough for listening to my Business of Story podcast. Your notes, tweets, and emails telling me how this program and our amazing guests have helped you live into a more powerful story make it all worthwhile. And yet, coming to you in audio only is the most one-dimensional way I can imagine to reignite within you the one true superpower we all possess, storytelling. So, picture me with you live. That's right. I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the power of story marketing, and I'm ready to do this for you and your people. You can book me for keynotes and workshops, brand story strategy consulting, and live webinars. You can also join me for free every Friday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time on Facebook Live. During my weekly show, I review the smart story marketers who are making an impact every day with their business storytelling. I take you through an element of the story cycle system that you can immediately apply to your brand story. And I offer up a free tool, tip, or technique that will help you clarify your brand story and rise above the noise of the attention economy. Just follow me on Facebook or join our private group called the Business of Story Tours. We'd love to have you be a part of our story marketing family. So let me help you get your story on by visiting my speaker page at businessofstory.com and start crafting and telling compelling stories that sell. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, James Popsis, who I was just so fortunate to happen upon about 10 days ago, his work, because he's out in sunny and beautiful, bright and warm Wales. Um, <laughs> well, I'll put an asterisk on that. And uh, he was kind enough to come on the show today. So, James, it's really great having you here. And again, if you're listening along and you've got a chance to jump on the web and look at his work, I think it'd be fun to see the images while he's talking about it. So visit James Popsis, that's P-O-P-S-Y-S dot com. So here I am, James. I'm on here looking at, I think, what is a shot from New Zealand. And you said you had been traveling there for quite a while. You've got a out-of-focus hand in the foreground reaching up to the sky that is creating the Wi-Fi logos out of clouds. And I think it's, well, it's entitled No Wi-Fi. What was going on there? Yeah, so that was uh, that moment came 
I'd say five, I want to say five weeks into a, a nine week road trip around New Zealand. Um, and it was a road trip that took place in, I mean, the, the company we hired it from called it a camper van. Um, it was, it was a car essentially that they had turned it <laughs> to, um, yeah, what they were calling a camper van. Uh, we had a great time, but it was, uh, I mean, you, you hear a lot of people now talk about, you know, addictions, addictions, so whether it's caffeine or the internet or whatever. Uh, and that was without doubt the longest we've gone with um, such limited internet. I say we, myself and my girlfriend. Um, and it was it was a real eye opener, to be honest, to see um, just how empty some elements of your life feel without um, a decent internet connection for a few weeks at a time. So um, fortunately, you know, I, I thought of the idea and then, you know, the next day we, we had a cloudless day in one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, which is the uh, Queen Charlotte Sound, um, just on the, the northern tip of the South Island of New Zealand. So that came together pretty well. Well, it, it's it's great. So um, you were talking too about when you were out traveling around, you kind of let your Instagram account fall by the wayside. And you have an interesting way of kickstarting it, uh, getting it going again that I'd like for you to share with our listeners. And I would imagine Instagram would be the primary channel for a visual artist like yourself to get your work out and to be known. Yeah, absolutely. So um for for listeners of of yours i mean they they may well go to my instagram account and wonder why you know i've got such a a modest audience or think what the hell is this guy talking about he hasn't got a clue he he hasn't really got any followers um it's primarily because i i decided to start my um account again fresh at the beginning of this year 2017 um and that was because last year while i was living in australia i, I really wasn't posting enough um i was distracted by primarily the beach and surfing um and also you know i found it really tricky to um to work in the same way i was in london while i was in australia just because um there, there isn't as much variety in terms of culture and um, and buildings and uh, you know architecture and people and that kind of thing and um, it took a bit of getting used to. Um, so it, for for a whole host of reasons in in 2016 I wasn't as productive as as I wanted to be. So um, this year sounded or seemed to me to be a decent point for a, a fresh start as far as Instagram was concerned. Um, so you've been in, you've been in it for about six weeks. And if you started at the beginning of this year and you're already at 2,500 followers, so that's not, not too, too bad. bad. Yeah, it's, it's not too bad. It's um, the other thing I, th I think was that um, the, the reason I decided to, to kickstart it again was that my engagement had um, plummeted because I wasn't posting enough. Um, and that is not an uncommon story now on pretty much any social network you know the 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 time of um those networks trying to build their their key audiences has, has come to an end and now they've got to try and find out how they monetize it um and so it, i think it's it's become fairly um common practice that algorithms are put into place that mean that you know if you're not posting regularly um that your your stuff won't be seen by as many people, even if those people decided to follow you at, in a, a point in the past. And um, what is regularly, do you think? Do you have to be on there every day or a few times a week? I mean, it's interesting. The, throughout the kind of years that I've been active on, on Instagram and certainly as a photographer, um, the, there has always been a debate about quality versus quantity. And that was the same when I was working in content marketing. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, that versus seems to have been replaced slowly by and, you know, people, um, people have come to accept, I think, that you can't choose between quality and quantity. Now, there's so much noise and competition out there that you have to attack everything with both. Um, so it's I'd say with Instagram, it, it seems like more and more people are willing to put a crazy amount of time into um, their social strategy and therefore they are present and uploading most days. Um, I, I kind of hesitate to put too much pressure on myself to do that just because um, my concepts can take anything from um, six to 12 hours to edit. 
Um, and when that's the case, you can't really be aiming to upload every day. So, uh, you know, if if you're um, a business or a, a photographer who who that doesn't apply to, then then there's no reason to to not be present every day. I mean, I think in the past people have um, voiced concerns of, of you know spamming their audience, um, and I really think that's that's a get out clause because. You know, the, there is no reason to worry about that if your quality is high. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the but real what, crux of it. So then what happens with a, an artist like you that all of your imagery here on Instagram, a very high quality, very high concept, and uh, you've had a, uh, you had a library of these that you could start with in 2017 and post them out and be very regular. But I would imagine that sometimes you go days, maybe if not a week or two, without a really good concept i mean one that you really like and you're you're proud of and you want to put out there i would imagine that would eat into your uh quantity pace so quality is definitely there but you know do you sometimes go a week or two weeks without posting anything because you've just run out of material absolutely and that you know for me luckily that's something that i hope to be able to uh ease this year just because i'm able to work full time at it now um but it's you know i at, at the same time as as it being you know a concern, I think there comes a point where you can't really um, be too worried about living your life uh, on a, a schedule of a, a social network. You know, if, I think as as important as quantity is, I think the quality still has to reign supreme. And and if one of them has to go, then I think it has to be the quantity. Yeah. So let me ask you, the first image I saw of yours that stopped me, and yet it may be the simplest of all of them in the concept, but there's just something about it that speaks to me. You've got an atlas opened up. It's got a color map in there. And what is it, France? What am I looking at? I'm not sure, but it's, you've got a red and white striped hot air balloon flying over the top of the book with a shadow, you know, falling down on it to give you that sense of elevation above it. It's very simple. It almost feels like a toy in there. And I don't know why it is, but it just stops me. What what was going through your head there? And how did you actually make that image? I, I mean, I've always been fascinated with maps. Um, don't know why, really don't know why, but I've, I, I really enjoy traveling. I, I love seeing new places. Um, and I was sat one day with my coffee looking at my atlas. Um, it was kind of maybe two weeks after I got back to the UK from New Zealand. And you kind of need a period of two weeks when you do that flight to kind of get over the the thought of any other travel ever again. Um, <laughs> and so I, I just got to that point, opened up the atlas with no real intention. Um, and it, it, you know, it must have just crossed my mind that actually, you know, it's, it's not too dissimilar to... Um, a photo of in fact now that I think of it maybe it's possible that I was looking at that and then in quick succession had seen a NASA photo perhaps on the news um, maybe from the space station um, and it dawned on me that those two could be switched and rather than using um, a photo of the earth I could use a photo of um, an atlas and I think initially I'd, I'd thought that I could have a an airliner flying over the atlas um, I thought after you know thinking about it for a little while I thought uh, a hot air balloon might be a bit more elegant mm -hmm. in terms of how I made it there's a brilliant service which um, is is a great help to people like me who do compositing um, when they're worried about uh, quantity um, it's called pixel squid uh, and essentially they supply um, fully made 2d uh, renders um, of all kinds of objects um, and you're then able to place those into photos and it makes it makes things possible that wouldn't be otherwise you know it's it would be very difficult to get a um, that perspective of a hot air balloon without being perhaps in another hot air balloon or being in a helicopter or whatever um, so it's much easier to be able to use a service like that. So you took the picture of the Atlas and then pulled in the Pixel Squid uh, asset to be able to then build it out. That's right. Yeah, I think that will be um, that will become more common for um, creators in the future borrowing assets from elsewhere, whether it be you know stock video clips or or photos. I think um, that seems to where it's heading, just because the demand on quantity is becoming more and more and more. Yeah, so um, I was just going through your equipment list here on your site. 
Uh, do you have to spend a fortune to be able to pull this off of what you're doing? Uh, no, in short. I mean, the programs that I use for a start have become much more affordable. Um, you know, you, typically in the past, you haven't had to look very hard for somebody who would argue that you never needed to buy Photoshop in the past. Um, you know, around uh, groups of designers and people, you'd always find um, free copies or copies that people had uh, found in back alleys or, or wherever they found them. Um, that's changed now, and, and Photoshop and uh, Lightroom are now provided by Adobe on a, um, a subscription basis at what I think is a really reasonable cost. Um, so that's not too expensive at all. In terms of uh, cameras, you can now pick up um, really good point and shoot cameras with pretty decent sized sensors um, that are capable of shooting raw, which means that you can you have a, a lot more uh, control of the file than you do with a, a compressed JPEG that um, a phone would capture, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but even that is not a big deal. You know, you can you can quite easily shoot um, photos on phones. Um, and get really good quality results. I mean, one of my um, most popular concepts to date is a photo called Overground, um, which is kind of shot uh, within a an underground train's uh, carriage, but out the window is the French Alps rather than a dark uh, tunnel. Um, and that was all done on, on my iPhone. Um, so it, it really isn't um, all that important to to be spending a lot of money now and even to tell you the truth uh, there are so many people i come across on instagram who um don't do any any of their editing on a computer they do it all on um new apps that are coming out all the time on their phone mm -hmm. um so yeah it, it's i mean as with all photography it's um it's becoming much uh, more affordable it's becoming much more accessible and i think that can only be a good thing and you do a nice job on your website to say, here's the equipment I use. And I'm surprised I don't see the ubiquitous Canon, the $3,500 Canon uh, camera on there. You've got a Nikon D750 and what, an Olympus OM-D, EM-5. I don't even know what I'm saying, but I do know <laughs> that it's typically Canon is what you see. But you've got some other equipment here. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... It's interesting. There's there's been a real push from camera manufacturers over the past number of years to up the megapixel count. Um, so it used to be the case that you know the the flagship cameras had maybe 12 megapixels, which meant in theory that you could print say a, a 16 by 20 inch print and it would look great. Um, now the the cameras are trying to up that number just to differentiate themselves because they're so good that there's no other way they can really um, call on a, a USP. You know, the, their capabilities are incredible in low light. Um, the, the sensors are huge. The dynamic range is massive. So they're just trying to make the, the cameras better at producing bigger files because it's the only direction they can move in to keep progressing and keep selling cameras. So it's, um, you know, any camera that you get and and spend more than you know three or four hundred dollars now will be more than capable of of um doing a great job in in allowing you to stitch images together yeah uh just a little sidebar note here since we have been talking about instagram i don't know if you've heard the podcast from national public radio npr here with guy Raz called how i built this and he's got um the founders the, the creators of instagram kevin sistrom and Mike Krieger on the show. Uh, I, it was recorded, what, back September 19th, 2016. Really a terrific show just to hear about how that whole media channel came about. Um, and terrific business storytelling, too, by the way, when you listen to it, is you uh, really get a terrific insight as to what they thought they were creating and what they ultimately ended up with, and then how they protected their creation after the fact. So highly recommend it to you and all of our listeners, How I Built This um, the, the founders of Instagram. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Sounds great. Oh. Finally, let's wrap up here. If you could give us some insights, what are, what are a couple things that we can do? Now, I'm a, uh, a total amateur street photographer, but I love just capturing the moment and people. And, you know, I go into uh, museums, for instance, we had uh, 
uh, Nick Gray from Museum Hack on a couple of weeks ago. And I told him, I said, I very rarely shoot the artwork. I shoot the people interacting with the artwork because I find the stories in those images to be way more fascinating and interesting to share with people. How, what, what would you recommend to us uh, visual storytelling wannabes to look for in an image that we could use to help cut through the noise online to be, become better visual storytellers? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think typically a good rule of thumb is if you haven't seen it before, it's it's worth taking note of. Um, and in, in terms of um, taking photos, I think, um, you know, there are whole heaps of uh, really basic tips for improving photos. But the, the two that always kind of speak to me are um, the rule of thirds, which is a, a pretty well known trick and basically all that means is you know if you're shooting something with a, a horizon move that horizon to either um, a third from the top or a third from the bottom of the frame and it makes it more interesting than having a, a horizon halfway through the image um, the the other um, rule i would say is if you're particularly if you're shooting people don't put the people in the middle of the frame um, it always creates a bit more interest if you have the subject slightly off center well, and is that a part of the rule of thirds as well? So that, that's yes. true for vertically as well as horizontally formatting your photos. Yeah. And I know I've had some others on the show that lighting, lighting, lighting. And I can say I've taken some shots that I, you know, really act, you know, captured the action beautifully, but the lighting was so flat, it just laid there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it, lighting's an interesting one. Um, uh, lighting seems to be the the area where particularly landscape photographers are, are paying most attention to at the moment. Um, you know, you see some fairly well-known photographers now um, trying to bring in more than one light source uh, into an image that would only ever have one light source, which is the sun. Um, so they will uh, try to blend uh, daytime images um, with with nighttime images in hope of, in the hope of making something really interesting to look at. And most of the time it's, it's really successful. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, as much as those people go into all that effort to do it, um, you know, if, if you can capture something interesting, uh, within a photo, you know, if, if the subject is doing something unusual or, um, or if there's something odd going on, something that you haven't seen before, then the lighting is secondary. Like it, it, it doesn't matter how flat an image might be. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if if you do have a flat image and you think it's lacking something, then I always find black and white seems to do the trick. <laughs> I do that. Yeah, that's my that's my fallback. OK, I blew the color shot, but boy, I could turn this into black and white. And all of a sudden I look like Ansel Adams. So it's that's great. it. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. To get out. Hey, can I add one more rule? And I think it's a rule, a rule that you really exemplify. And it's one of my favorite all times terms in photography, and that is the uh, famous line of F8 and B there. Are you familiar with that line? I am, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, it's always important, especially in places like London, where you don't know what you're going to see around the next corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, to particularly with cameras now, you know, you can leave them on consistently um, and they it doesn't use a whole lot of the battery they'll go into sleep mode or whatever but if your camera's always on and you've always got it got it set to f8 so a lot of the frame is in focus then you don't need to worry about missing any shots well and and the deeper meaning to that line which i love is you got to be there you got to get off your couch and like you said none of your creativity comes to you when you're sitting around it's when you are out and about on a plane on a train you are experiencing life and you have the aha moment. So that's that be there that I love so much about it. F8 and be there. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Well, James, thank you so much for being on Business of Story. Really a delightful show and loved the insights. And folks, if you haven't been there yet, I really recommend you get over to James' uh, website, James. Popsis, P O P S Y S dot com. Um, the, you'll, you'll just delight at his, at his creations there. So thank you for being here. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much for having me. All right. And thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. While you're online, by the way, jump over to iTunes, if you would, and look us up. Give us a rating on the show. Give us a, a shout out, if you would. It helps, of course, share Business of Story with your world. Um, and we really, really appreciate it here. And if there's anything I can do to help you become a more powerful storyteller in your 
personal in, uh, brand to create your influence or your professional brand, please let me know. Visit me over at businessofstory.com. I've got a ton of free tools for you to use there to help you really get your brand story straight. After all, that's what this program's all about, is to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And that's why we go out of our way to bring brilliant story artists like James onto the show. So hope you've enjoyed what you've heard today. And please join us next Monday when we will have another incredible story artist just for you. Until then, have a wonderful life. <music>